It's been a good minute since we've covered some creepy and allegedly true park ranger horror stories. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends. It's good to see you made it back for another episode. Today, I'm back once again with some allegedly true and creepy as hell park ranger horror stories. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that truly help keep this show going on a daily basis. Now, without further ado, let's get into these creepy and allegedly true park ranger horror stories. Back in 1999, I used to work as a park ranger over at Yosemite National Park. It wasn't a job I ever really saw myself doing. The fact was that, after I busted my knees and had to stop playing football, the NFL was all I ever dreamed of. I was obsessed. It was football in the morning, football in the afternoon, and at night, I used to dream of football. But, like many young men's dreams, they turned out to be nothing but the stuff of pipes. I needed a job, I needed money, and I needed it fast. So when an uncle told me of an opening at the Yosemite National Park for a park ranger position, I jumped at the chance. He told me it was relatively easy work, mostly outdoors, and I could rely on it. As long as there was state funding, as long as there were still trees sprouting out of the ground, I'd always have work. So there I was, 23 years old, decked out in my park ranger's uniform, hiking through valleys and over hills, popping ibuprofen whenever my knees started to act up. I'd done the job for about two years in March of 99, and honestly, I'd grown to love it. Being out there meant being surrounded by nature on a daily basis. I mean, I'd see things weekly that wildlife photographers could give their left nut to document but I never in my wildest dreams thought I'd encounter the kind of thing I did on March 18th, 1999. It's something that I've thought about almost every single day since. Something I can't ever get out of my mind, and something I don't think I ever will. And it all started off a chain of events that I gradually became obsessed with, and that have changed my life forever. It started with a call about a potential forest fire. My boss called me and told me a hiker had seen some smoke rising up through the trees up near a place called Long Cabin in Sonora County. I probably don't need to tell you that forest fires can be absolutely devastating to an area like Yosemite, and they are taken very, very seriously by us park rangers. Now, you all should know that Long Cabin isn't technically in our jurisdiction. It's actually closer to Stanislaus National Forest. But since there was no one up in that area to go check it out, my boss asked me to go check it out and call in the fire department if there was a serious threat. We got a good number of calls like this, and more often than not, it was just a family's whose barbecue has gotten out of hand. Or kids whose campfire is a little too big. So I agreed to drive up there to check it out, as it was only a couple of hours drive there and back. After about an hour's drive, I arrive up at Long Barn and I can see some black smoke rising up through the trees in the distance. This is unusual, as black smoke means it's not just wood burning, more like plastic or artificial fabrics, so it definitely wasn't wood burning. This is kind of a relief at first. It meant it wasn't an outright forest fire, but it did mean someone was burning something that was definitely not good for the environment. I park up close as I can to the source of the smoke. Then... I hike up through the trees, basically just following my nose as the smell of burning plastics got stronger and stronger. Then I see it. A burnt out car, abandoned among the trees. It was still kind of smoldering, but I guess the fire had been set at night and had mostly burned through before I got the call about it. My first thought was joyriders. Something as simple as car thieves that had bust into somebody's vehicle, tore it up, and then crash it down this quiet, country road. Again, this is pretty unusual, especially as a crime out here in the sticks. 
and you can forgive me for associating that sort of wanton mischief with more urban areas. But when I started to smell something else among the smoke, something more like burning meat, I'm a huge barbecue guy myself, and I know what it smells like when you leave something on the grill for far too long. Like that acrid, charred stench that I know is going to lead to disappointment because I've messed up on some expensive T-bone or whatever. Only, you're definitely not supposed to smell that coming off of a burning car, are you? And as you can imagine, I started to feel very, very uneasy about this whole situation. I circled around the burned vehicle, looking for signs of animal carcasses or, God forbid, human bodies that were in or around the vehicle, but I saw nothing. I even checked under the car, but again, I didn't see a thing. I pulled out my phone to get in touch with the Sonora County Sheriff, who said he'd send over a couple of guys to check the scene out within the next hour or so, but he also asked me to stick around so I could guide them in and show them exactly where the vehicle was. So. Given the fact I had an hour or two to kill waiting for them, I went into the trunk of my truck, pulled out the little fire extinguisher stored back there, and proceeded to go to the few small fires burning in and around the vehicle and put them out. I do so pretty effectively, but when I'm done, I notice they're still smoldering in the trunk. Smoke keeps seeping out of the cracks, and the more it does, the more I can tell the smell of burning meat is coming from there. That's when it really hit me. Something, or someone, was in that trunk. That's where the smell was coming from. Waiting for those sheriff deputies seemed like it took an eternity, mainly because when they got there, I knew they'd be able to open that trunk, and I really didn't want to see what was inside. So they got there. I tell them what I suspect was happening, and what I suspect was in that trunk. One of the guys uses a crowbar to wrench the trunk open which was pretty easy considering the fire had warped the metal locks keeping it closed. But what we saw is something I saw over and over again in my nightmares for many nights to come. It was a mass of blackened, burned flesh and contorted limbs. The sight of it alone caused me to gag and retch, puking up my breakfast onto the forest floor. Even those deputies hardened by years of witnessing violence and cruelty on a daily basis, had a hard time dealing with what they were seeing. One just leaned against a tree, mouth covered with a cloth rag to keep him straight, probably for this exact reason. While the other called in the coroner to deal with the bodies, they told me I could move back to Yosemite whenever I was ready. And boy, was I ready. I got the hell out of there as soon as I was able to. From what I understand... The sheriff's deputies soon discovered that the two scorched bodies in the trunk of that burned vehicle were those of Carol Sund and Silvina Peluso. The two women, along with Carol Sund's young daughter Julie, had been missing since the previous February. When they were last sighted alive and well, they were at Cedar Lodge near Yosemite National Park. It was actually one of my colleagues over at the park that had been the last person to see them alive, and the whole thing had drawn national attention landing them on the cover of People magazine when some journalist took an interest in the story. And I mean, it was a really interesting story, albeit a very morbid one. Carol's son's wallet had been found on a street in downtown Modesto, California, three days after they had disappeared, and Julie's son's body was dumped in heavy underbrush by an overlook at the Don Pedro Reservoir, several miles from the logging trail where the car had been found. Her throat had been slit from ear to ear. Local sheriffs and the FBI initially focused their investigation on a group of meth heads up in Northern California who had previous convictions for stalking and assaulting lone groups of women. But all those leads were abandoned when a break in the case cast light on another suspect. Because the story doesn't end here. In fact, it got even worse for all of us who worked up in Yosemite. One of the staff members at the Yosemite Institute was a young woman named Joy Ruth Armstrong. Joy was friendly, bubbly, and generally just an awesome person to be around. I'd only ever met her once or twice in my time as a park ranger, but I could see why she was a popular member of the team. She loved nature, she loved her job, even more passionately than most others on the staff. 
but in July of the same year of 1999, Joy had made plans to spend a weekend visiting friends down in Sausalito. Team members who lived in the log cabin she shared with them in Yosemite Village said their goodbyes, wished her a safe travel, and watched as she wandered off among the trees to catch a ride down to Sausalito. But a few days later, when she was due to return to the village, she never showed up. She'd actually left some contact details with the team just in case they needed to talk to her, but when they followed up with the call to check up on her, her friends told them she hadn't actually arrived to spend the weekend with them and that they were starting to get worried. A group of park rangers went over to the cabin where she stayed at, only to find her white pickup truck was still parked in the driveway, packed with her luggage for the trip. Having decided to begin their search in the immediate area, the rangers split up into smaller groups. They trudged through the dense underbrush, watching for rattlesnakes and looking for signs of their missing co-worker. Then, after only a short while of searching, they apparently spotted footprints, broken saplings, trampled ferns and grass, all signs that someone had recently ran or perhaps even been chased. That's when one of the rangers noticed something metallic glinting in the sunlight just a few feet away. It was a key ring, lying in a shallow ditch. It was the sighting of this key ring that led them to spot something else. It was a dead body. It had on the white t-shirt and blue jeans that Joy had been wearing the day she left. Except now, they were filthy, dirty, encrusted and blood-stained. But despite bearing such similarities to our missing co-workers, it was impossible to immediately identify her body. That was because whoever killed her had also taken the time to cut off her head, decapitating it completely. For those of us who worked in and around Yosemite, Joy's murder meant that the nightmare of those who burned the bodies, the nightmare we had all tried to forget about, had come back with a vengeance. The killings were made even more disturbing to us by how rare it was for anything like that to happen in this area of California. According to one of the older rangers, the last known murder to occur inside Yosemite's boundaries happened 12 years earlier in 1987 when a guy pushed his wife off a cliff in order to collect on a life insurance policy. As you can tell, I've thought about this whole thing a lot and researched the various murders a whole lot and I've discovered that the chances of being murdered in one of our nation's national parks are about 1 in 20 million. Basically, you have more of a chance of drowning in your own bathtub. So, please don't think this is an actual thing. Please don't think people just hang around in the woods waiting to kill unwary hikers. I know this was a very long story, but I'm sure you can all understand. This is something I've been quite frankly obsessed about. Since the discovery of those burned bodies affected me so personally, I'm actually considering writing a book about the whole thing and my experiences living and working in places that these crimes occur. I will not tell you who I am. I cannot tell you where this happened. And I cannot tell you when this happened. I got death threats for months after this. I had to quit my job. I had to move. I had to change my entire identity to stop people from finding me. Some of you sickos will no doubt put in the time and research into working out all the details yourself. But just let me make it clear that my details were expunged from the employment records and you will never, ever find me. And so, I can finally make my confession in peace. I used to work as a park ranger at a well-known, frequently visited national park. At this national park, there was an old ghost story that the veteran rangers used to talk about. They used to talk about these weird noises that would come from a lake. The noise had apparently sounded like a puppy yelping and splashing, but the ranger who heard it could not swim and was not about to put himself in danger of drowning just to save a dog. The next day, the body of a young child washed up on the shore. It was never a dog out there. It was a child that had fallen in the lake after being out there exploring unsupervised. The park ranger was devastated. His spirit crushed that his selfishness had resulted in the death of an innocent child. He was haunted by the thought. 
took to drinking wore himself down until one night, while sleeping in his cabin, he heard a familiar noise coming from the lake. It was the sound of a little boy, crying out to be rescued. He ran to the lakeside, dived into the water, and struggled his way into the center of the body of water until he reached the side of the splashing. But there, he only saw the smiling, bloated corpse of that same little boy who dragged him beneath the lake and drowned him just as he had. That is the way the story went, and to be honest, I thought it was the biggest load of bull I had ever heard in my life. I told the crusty old timers that same thing, that I'd have to be of diminished capacity to believe a crock of bull like that. But, instead of laughing or whatever, like, okay, maybe this guy isn't as dumb as we first thought, they got all annoyed about it. They told me not to disrespect the angry spirits of the departed, but then it was my turn to laugh. I could tell the difference between them getting annoyed over me disrespecting the dead or whatever, and them getting annoyed over me not, you know, respecting their dumb story. The following week, I found I had my shift pattern switched to nights. I confronted them about it and told them I was not impressed that they were so immature as to switch my shifts up, but they insisted that... It was only to cover for a guy whose mom had taken ill and had been forced to drive back to his home state to take care of her. I did not believe a word of it, and I was just straight up angry at that point. Angry that a pair of grown men would lie about something like that, basically just to gaslight me. But I did not want to show them how frustrated I was. I would just take their crap on the chin, so to speak, and not give them the satisfaction. So the first night I am there in the lakeside cabin, I am settling in to prepare for a long night of utter boredom, brewing coffee, and playing dumb mobile games. When I hear something from outside the cabin, I put down the phone, get up and walk over to the door. I open it up as much as I can so I can listen out for what it is, but I recognize it instantly. It is the sound of splashing, coupled with the sound of a child crying out for help between spluttered breaths. Haha, <laughs> very funny. I remember shouting out into the darkness. Think you can scare me with your dumb stories? Well, I did not believe them. And I do not believe you now. Try it on someone with an IQ as low as yours. This was obviously their little game playing out. Their attempt to scare me into submission and believing their backward-ass ghost story. But I was not about to let that happen. I went back inside, slamming the door shut and jamming my airpods into my ears on full volume to block the noise out. They were selfish, vindictive people. That is what I told myself anyway. But apparently, not determined enough to keep playing the sound from whatever speaker system they had set up around the cabin, because when I paused my music like 20 minutes later, the noise was gone, and all was quiet again. The next morning, just after sunrise... I packed up my stuff and prepared to leave the cabin. I was so exhausted and irritated by the prank they pulled, I was not prepared to wait for them to arrive. I figured if I did, I would be so angry at seeing them that I might have knocked some of their damn teeth out. That would get me fired, and I simply could not afford that. Not with the economy in the state that it was. But I was walking to my truck. Something catches my eye from the lakeside. Something small and sodden that the gentle waves of the lake lapped against. I turned to look and saw what it was. And when I did, I dropped my bag in pure horror and disbelief at what I was staring at. The body of a child, face down in the dirt. I pulled out my phone, dialed 911, and basically screamed at the operator for an ambulance to get out to the place I was. They had to send a helicopter in the end. But before it showed up, the two crusty old rangers rolled up in their truck, and their damn eyeballs almost fell out of their head when they saw me trying to perform CPR on the dead kid. I tried, and tried, and tried, but he was gone, long gone, and it was all my own damn fault. I ended up word vomiting about what happened the night before, telling them everything. How I had thought the whole thing was a prank, part of the punishment for not believing their damn story. They claimed to have no idea what I was talking about, which angered me even more. But when they asked me why I did not help the kid, I flipped out. 
I rushed one of the older guys, tackled him, and beat the living hell out of him before I was dragged off and talked back down to earth. But I could not really calm down. Not until the chopper arrived and put that kid's body on a stretcher. The paramedics seemed furious. There was no one to save. I remember one of them explicitly shouting over the din of the blades, The kid's been dead for hours. When they took off, and I drove back home to go on an indefinite paid leave, I thought that might have been the end of it, and that I would have the time and space to get over what happened. But I did not have time. Someone leaked information on what happened. I do not know if it was the old timer I decked, the other ranger, or the paramedics, but somehow, someone got a hold of my contact details, and the threatening calls began. I'll never forget the night my girlfriend answered the phone in our apartment, saying hello in the happy, chirpy way she always used to. I watched as her face went from all smiley, to neutral, to downright horrified. Who is this? Hey, who the hell is this? Call here again and I'm calling the cops. It was the first of many death threats, the first of many, many calls, handwritten letters, and emails that told me I was an awful person that I did not deserve to live, that I was dead to the world the night I let that poor, innocent young boy drown in that lake. When his lungs filled with the water and the death spasms racked his body, he was not the only one to die. I died too. She was not my girlfriend for much longer, and I do not even blame her. There are not many people who could handle that kind of abuse, and I only got through it by myself, by the skin of my teeth. And so... That led me to where I am today. I live alone in a state of fear, far away from the national park I allowed a child to drown. I legally changed my name, changed my entire look so no one from my old life would be able to recognize me. I went through an intense period of transformation. The old me is a ghost, as good as dead, dust in the wind, and no one will ever find me. No one. My name is Tom Kinski, and I am the Vice Chair of the Boston Grotto, a cave and club affiliated with the National Speleological Society. We meet the first Wednesday of every month on MIT campus and regularly send out open invitations in the hopes of attracting new members. There are always people who show up interested. I'd like to think this wasn't just due to the pizza we order in the upper crust on Charles Street. But who am I kidding? Everyone loves pizza. The Boston Grotto also organizes yearly caving trips to some fascinating, far-flung places. Last summer, we planned a deep cave expedition in the Karstik Limestone Plateau of southern Turkey. We actually helped map out the lower reaches of the cave system, extending the depth of the Morka Cave from 919 meters to 1,240 meters. It is now officially the third deepest cave in Turkey all thanks to our hard work and dedication. It's a very, very fulfilling hobby, but caving is neither easy nor is it really relaxing. In fact, on occasion, caving can be hazardous, terrifying, or even fatal. I have plenty of stories detailing brushes with danger and death, but the one I'm about to tell you is the one that sticks with me the most. So a few years back, a park ranger from the Glacier National Park in Montana got in touch with the NSS regarding a previously unexplored cave system. Christy Starr, the manager of the NSS, then referred the park ranger to us due to our expertise in mapping out unexplored sections of cave systems. The park ranger then got in touch with the Boston Grotto, and then basically offered us an all-expenses-paid caving trip to the Glacier National Park. Needless to say, we were ecstatic. You see, whether we're talking about Francis Dark, Magellan, or even Lewis and Clark, we can conclude that most, if not all, of the Earth's surface has been thoroughly documented and mapped out. There is very little in the way of land left to explore, but the same cannot be said for what lies beneath our feet. The National Spaleological Society alone estimates that only 10 to 15% of the world's cave systems have even been documented and mapped out. And I'm not sure people realize just what an opportunity 
that presents to people like us. We have the chance to explore places that no man or woman has ever stepped foot in before, to truly be the next generation of explorers, carrying the torch in place of ancient sailors, 19th century African adventurers, or even the spacefaring astronauts of the 60s and 70s. I mean, there's the very real possibility of being able to name something like the Kinski Caves, or something along those lines. The very real possibility that some of us could be immortalized in the way that Stanley or Abbott have been, giving their names to Port Stanley in Africa or Abbottabad in British India. And so it was that myself and two other members of the Boston Grotto ended up driving all the way out to Montana in a van filled with caving gear, snacks, and beer. Given that the drive took a couple of days, we made something of a road trip out of it, stopping at Chicago to stretch our legs and take in the sights of the Windy City. Accompanying me on the trip was Paul Hutch Hutchinson, coordinator of experienced-based training here at Boston University, and another member of the grotto, Nestor Ramos. Previously employed by Lynchburg College, Virginia, Hutch had expanded the outdoor leadership program to including backpacking, rock climbing, horizontal caving, vertical caving, and canoeing, as well as creating an academic minor in recreation. To others, caving and other outdoor activities were just a hobby, but for Hutch, it was more of a vacation, something he was compelled to do, something that was in his blood. And he brought that same passion to almost everything he did. Nestor, on the other hand, was a relatively newer member of the grotto, but what he lacked in raw experience, he made up for in enthusiasm and competence. He was a natural in many ways and made the younger me very envious indeed. After almost five days worth of driving, we finally made it out to Browning, Montana. We stopped to get a bite to eat and then headed further down the highway until we reached where we'd be staying. The Traveler's Rest Lodge, a set of log cabins that were every bit as charming and as rustic as I had imagined. We slept like the dead that night, and after sleeping in a van for four nights, I had never been so appreciative of the divine human invention that is the mattress. The next morning came and the trip out to Glacier National Park itself began. We packed up our gear, which included our very specialized helmets, lights, thin, comfortable with a four-point suspension that will stay in on a fall, as well as being safe to mount batteries, flashlights, and brackets too. We threw extra batteries and flashlights into small, utilitarian backpacks, along with extra layers of warm clothing, as well as food and water. But then came perhaps the coolest part of the trip so far. Given that Glacier National Park is pretty much inaccessible to anyone but experienced hikers, the park rangers out there had planned something a little special for us to save us an exhausting trip. A helicopter ride into the park itself was set up for us. We were told to be in a specific field at a certain time, which we were, and seeing the chopper coming in from a distance, the thudding of its rotor blade shattering the early morning tranquility, it was just incredible. I'm a huge fan of old war movies, and if it wasn't so chilly that morning, I might have felt like we were back in Vietnam or something special force guys being airlifted behind enemy lines or something like that. Despite being ferried deep into the National Park via helicopter, finding a safe place to drop us off was another thing entirely. We landed about a mile's hike from the cave system itself, with one of the park rangers guiding us up a set of steep paths, which led to a tiny, restrictive entrance on a mountainside. We arrived a call-out time of around 7.30 that evening. Enough time for us to get out of the cave and back down the mountain and landing at the site before sunset. After that, the park ranger left us to hike back down to the chopper, and our journey began in earnest. I immediately understood why the cave system was previously unexplored. The entrance was barely traversable, even to us experienced cavers, and more than once I had to completely exhale to make my torso fit through the narrower gaps. Hutch was the point man as he headed in, and each little cranny he had to shimmy through was properly assessed for danger. A larger man might have come stuck, stuck to suffer the same fate as the guy in Utah about ten years earlier, something I wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy. After about an hour or so of serious anxiety that verged on claustrophobia, the tunnels began to open up a little, and uh, I really do mean only a little. 
they were still narrow enough that we could do nothing but crawl, but it was a little bit better. In order to get deeper inside a place that apparently no man or woman had tread before, it was terrifying, but thrilling in a way that I don't think I can put into words. It's like one long burst of adrenaline, knowing you're the vanguard of subterranean exploration, and you can almost feel it buzzing in your fingertips. So the last thing I was expecting when we found ourselves crawling into a larger, more open cave was to hear Hutch's disappointment. As you can imagine, you can't make loud noises in a cave system. You have to be as quiet as possible, given the reverberations and echoes can quite literally cause a cave-in if the rock isn't of a certain density. So, at first I couldn't quite make out what Hutch was getting at. I mean, I seriously thought he was injured or something at first. He started hissing and whispering curses, bawling his fist in frustration as something he'd seen illuminated by the lamp on his helmet. After he crawled through, I watched him sit down, leaning back against the cave wall, his face obscured by his hands. I asked him what the matter was. He shook his head, a melancholy to his body language that I'd rarely seen before as he pointed over to the opposite side of the cave. There, lying on the cold stone floor, was a burlap sack, a small leather-bound notebook sitting just nearby. Just then did I join him against the wall, sorely lamenting the fact that this wasn't going to be the virgin expedition that we imagined it to be. But that didn't mean we were ready to give up. Not by a long shot. Whoever had been down in this place previously had obviously never officially recorded their findings. So the door for us to map out and name the place was still very much a possibility. But before we pushed on, we decided to search the burlap sack and inspect the small book for clues as to what we might be up against as we moved deeper. As I kicked open the sack, I could see there were the remains of some old food container, along with an old-style water flask, both of which were empty. They looked old, extremely old, and I hurried to inspect the small book to see if it had any trace of a date. The thing fell apart in my hands, moisture and time having long eroded the pages and bindings, but we did find a page where the date was partly legible. It read 1860-something, the last number completely worn away by the damp cave air. The book had been sitting down there for the better part of 200 years, and although we couldn't read a single full sentence of what was written on it, I'd have given anything to know what the cavers of yore thought of the subterranean experiences. As we advanced further into the cave system, I couldn't help but wonder just what could cause an explorer to abandon their notebook like that. But we soon discovered the reason. Two caves over, we found them. Hutch called it out as soon as the beam of his headlamp passed over the dome of rib bones that jutted out from the rock. It was nothing short of terrifying. Knowing they'd come down here one day, never to return, never to see their loved ones again, and all while their reasoning for being down here eluded us. After that, here we were. Three things we saw before we turned tail and got out of there. The first were the skeleton's finger bones. Basically, a person's finger bone is divided up into three distinct sections known as phalanges, the smallest sections being the person's fingertip. These have a pretty distinct shape. Go ahead and Google it, and you'll see what I mean. So it was pretty evident to us that something traumatic had occurred that wore the tips of the bones away. It felt intensely creepy. Speculating how this guy had potentially lost his way in the caves, gone mad as a result of the deprivation and darkness, and began to scratch the walls of the cave until his fingers had worn down into the bone, and even then, he hadn't stopped scratching. But we couldn't find any sections of the cave wall that bore any marks that he would have made, which led us to a second thing we saw before we got the hell out of there. It was his skull. There were scratch marks on his skull, right around the orbital sockets. None of us said a word. As we studied this thing, the yellowing bone under our headlamps. It was obvious what had occurred here, down in the dark almost 200 years before. He had scratched out his own eyes. We were already backing out of the cave at that point, praying we wouldn't get lost on the way back as this poor soul had obviously done. I tried not to think about the moment that poor soul's lamp light had run out, condemning him to spend the last little time of his life in absolute darkness. I tried to show Hutch and Nestor, but they weren't in the least bit interested in hanging around any longer. And to be honest, I totally understood why. 
As we sat around the open field that we had landed at, waiting for our helicopter taxi to arrive, we agreed not to talk about what we had seen until we got back to Boston. There was a good chance that if we told the rangers what we had seen, they'd ask us to go back in to retrieve the body of the old caver, something none of us were particularly keen to do. And as much as we agreed not to talk about it until we got back home, there never did come a time when we discussed what we had seen down there. Ever. I mean, when the park rangers asked how the caving had gone, we just told them it was unsafe to be down there, and there was no chance of turning the cave system into a tourist trap, let alone a place for experienced cavers to go when they want to challenge. Let alone, a place for experienced cavers to go when they want to challenge. I suppose I've waited a long time to get this whole thing off my chest. So now, I suppose everyone knows about the body down there in the caves of Glacier National Park. Growing up, I was always on the heavy side. I suppose it is because I come from a family of food lovers, whose portion control was never their strongest suit. It was all TV dinners and sedentary hobbies, so it is no wonder we are all a certain size and shape. But it always bothered me. I would see the attention skinnier girls got around the school, and I know, it does not align with my mostly feminist view of the world, but I wanted that to be me too. So a few years back, I started my own personal weight loss journey. Not so much that I could fit society's view of what beautiful is, but so that I could have confidence in myself and in my own body. I wanted to look good for me, and if that helped me land a hot guy, then cool. This is how I took up hiking as a hobby, and why I spent so much time around Acadia National Park up here in Maine. The views up there also allowed me to indulge another hobby of mine, photography. And sure, my pictures do not make it any further than my Instagram account. But still, it is something that brings me a lot of joy. Sometimes I would drive up there with friends, but they could not commit to those long trips all the time. So there were times when I would go up to Acadia all alone to get my few hours of exercise in. So, I am hiking the trails up there, taking pictures of the sun as it glinted off the ocean through the trees. Messing around with filters and usual photography stuff, I thought I had managed to get the most amazing shot. Something that was bound to get a whole bunch of attention on Instagram. When I hear a voice sounding from behind me. Lovely day for it, huh? It was a man's voice. Friendly sounding, but still the shock of hearing it so suddenly made me jump. I turned, seeing a man in a park ranger's uniform. The hat, the little shorts, the whole getup walking up the trail behind me with one of those trekking poles in his hand. Uh, yeah, I got, got to make the most of the nice weather here in Maine. It's super rare. I tried to sound as cheerful as possible, but I will not lie. I did not really want the attention, at least not from an older guy like that, who had also managed to ruin the composition of the photograph I was in the process of taking. I know that makes me sound unfriendly or whatever, but honestly... Sometimes we girls just prefer to be left alone. But he continued to make conversation. In that super annoying way that some people do. It's almost like they can detect that you just want to have some time to yourself. And instead, opt for being gregarious. So, I remained polite for as long as I could. Nodding along as he talked about how lonely it could get being a park ranger up here. Then eventually just straight up asked him politely to let me just do my photography making something up about being a professional photographer who was surveying the area for a magazine I worked for. I know I should not have lied, but I got the distinct impression he was not going to leave me alone otherwise. But he took it on the chin. I suppose he got the craving for human contact out of his system. He told me he was sorry to interrupt, wished me good luck with my work, and then carried on down the trail. So I take my photos, taking my time over them, but decided to turn back to walk the opposite way so I do not run into him again. It's not that I really thought he was creepy or anything. I just did not want to run into him again. Call me neurotic for wanting to avoid awkward moments, but that is just the way I felt about it. So, I am heading back the opposite way, taking pictures along the way, capturing the way the trails snake through the trees in such pretty ways sometimes, looking like something out of a fairy tale. 
I happen to take a particularly aesthetically pleasing one, and I am admiring it on my phone when I happen to notice some small detail in the center right of the frame. It was a figure. It was clearly wearing a pair of shorts, peeking out from among the trees. I know this is an innocuous little detail. I know it was just the ranger I had seen an hour previous, but it sent a chill through me. Just how the hell did he manage to loop around and get ahead of me, even though he walked off in the opposite direction that I had? I felt distinctly unsafe. A flash of fear running through me as I began to suspect that this ranger guy's intentions were far from good. I mean, who just follows someone like that? Or rather, it was not even following me that he was doing. This guy was straight up stalking me. But I had no choice but to walk by him. He had literally put himself between me and my car, so I had to just suck it up and walk past him. Even if I was putting on a brave face to do so, I decided to cut him off, if that makes sense. I was prepping myself to just be like, Hi there, can't stop, late back for a meeting. Or something to that effect. But it was him that spoke first. You know, it's not safe for a girl like you to be walking around the park alone. I can't remember exactly what he said. That's just my estimation of it. You're really pretty, and bad things can happen to a pretty girl that walks around on her lonesome. I was ruined. I tried to think of something witty to say. Some cutting retort that would shame him for being way, way too familiar. But I could not. I was just terrified. Who the hell says that to a total stranger? So I just carried on walking, at an increased speed, ready to call 911 if he started to follow me. But he didn't... he didn't follow me at all. He just shouted, Where are you going? Don't you want some company? Take care of being rude like that, little lady. You might just end up being rude to the wrong person. I thought stuff like that only happened in horror movies, or something like that. That creeps like that could not really be walking among us. Or if they were, I suppose I just hoped I would never encounter one. So I get to the end of the trail, back to the parking lot where I had left my car, when I see another ranger milling around the area, taking little markers out of his truck or something. I walked up to him and demand to know who the ranger on duty was, describing the guy that I saw, how his uniform was all dirty and stuff, how he carried that trekking pole, when suddenly I just started to feel sick. This ranger? His uniform looked almost nothing like the guy back in the woods. It was clean, pressed, and starched. Lighter khaki color and different styles of patches on it. Same kind of main park service thing, just different looking. I knew what he was going to say before he even said it. There was no other park ranger on duty at the time. He was the only guy in the area, and no one else should have been wearing a ranger's uniform. He saw the look of horror on my face, that nauseous, shell-shocked look as I realized how much danger I had been in walking around with that guy in the loose. I told him everything, but I did not stick around to see what came of it. I just got in my car and went back down north towards Ellsworth. And it took me a long, long time before I was able to go back to Acadia, even with friends. I make a point of never, ever going to secluded places like that alone now. It is just not worth the risk of running into someone like that. Someone willing to dress up to trick young women into feeling safe when they may well have had quite different intentions. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true park ranger horror stories. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to hit that like button as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this video gets, the more YouTube promotes it in the algorithm. If you're listening to this on iTunes or another podcast platform, please give this a 5 star rating as it truly helps the show grow. If you guys are new to the channel, why not join us? Hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications to never miss a new video as I upload them on everything natural and supernatural almost every single day. I'd love to know down in the comments down below what story was your favorite tonight. I'd have to say, that first story might be my favorite. That was pretty intense. If you're on the go, 
and don't have YouTube Premium, but you would like to download and listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller Scary Stories no matter where you are, you can do so absolutely free by downloading them from iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, and just about everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future video, whether it's a park ranger story or something out in the outdoors that you experience, I would love to share it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. If you guys would like to support the swamp outside of hitting that like button and subscribing, maybe check out the merch store. I have hoodies, t-shirts, face masks, and much more. I'd love to see you guys wearing some cool Swamp Dweller threads. Thank you guys as always for supporting the swamp the way you do. I couldn't do this on a daily basis without all of you guys hitting that like button, subscribing, and sending in the stories that you do. Again, if you have a story that you'd like to share in a future video, send it in at swampdweller.net. I'll see you guys soon with another creepy video.